Hey, this is Daryl from the 365 Message Centre show. I don't know why I started out that way, but we'll just start introducing the episode. Uh, we have Teams Attendance Reports tab so that when you get to the end of your meeting, your attendance sits somewhere else. We'll get into that deeper. There's a, a thing around scheduling meetings that um, AI is supposed to take care of that for us, but yeah, it was an interesting conversation in the community. And lastly, a real tongue twister and yet another issue for the community that we're trying to figure out what the heck this message says about SharePoint and updates to Teams connected team sites. What a mouthful. Let's get into it, Daniel. We do indeed have two messages that really got the community going on the socials this week and i think rightfully so so we'll we'll have a conversation on that daryl how are you sir you good uh yeah i, I am good uh yeah, i have enjoyed the um the lively conversation within the community mm -hmm. as they have reacted to certain things and uh talked about hopes for the future and uh hopes for clarifying things yeah i uh, i just want to say a quick Shout out to all of my uh, existing and new friends from last week at the Microsoft 365 uh, Collaboration Conference. I uh, had a great time and uh, learned a lot and was able to um, really experience community in person um, for the first time in a really long time. And I, and I am very grateful that I got that privilege. I know there's a lot of people that can't do that yet, so I want... Uh, do know um, that that is something that's a great privilege. So I, I really enjoyed it. That's fantastic. To hear. <clears throat> we Towards are the way for us, Daniel. Yes. Well, uh, so we are one episode away from 200. This is episode 199. So really looking forward to next week. If you uh, really want to um, take part in, in, in a, it's, this is going to be kind of a landmark episode for us, I think. Uh, make sure you tune in um, next week. But let's get into the messages, shall we? First yes, off, yes. live transcription. Live transcriptions. Uh, so this is a, a very useful feature for um, making things more accessible for us so we can see the words pop up on the screen as we're within a meeting. And this is MC260564, where... Uh, if I just go back a bit, Daniel, and I won't go back too far, but in stream, um, we used to have some AI that would create a transcription for us. It would also recognize faces, and we could we could go through and um, see, see those those words. And I think some of that same technology has been improved and brought into Microsoft Teams to bring transcription through. We see transcription in PowerPoint sometimes, don't we? Have you used that before? I have indeed. It's really nice as well to when you're speaking to a group that maybe have a primary language that's different than yours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is going to um, pop up, I guess, uh, the the um, the words as, as people are speaking um, within a meeting. There will be speaker attribution, and it's quite fun to see it as it appears on screen because it actually looks like chat. Uh, when you first see it, you think, oh, is that someone typing that quickly or is it is it there? So that's that's kind of cool. Um, it is going to be available in English US to begin with. One key thing is that it'll be available just from Teams desktop. You won't be able to see it from Teams mobile and it won't be visible in Teams on the web. So if you want to take advantage of this, um, then that's where you'll need to see it. It also needs to be a scheduled meeting. So it can't be something that you've just started a meet now and it wouldn't be just a call that let's say Daniel and I added two or three people right now to this call. It becomes a, a meeting of sorts, but we can't have uh, live transcription in that. So apart from that, um, you've seen just on screen there, just it, it covers the usual licenses that we expect. Apparently it's been available in Enterprise E3, E5 and business standard and premium customers um, for already. It's already alive and, and, and available. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, due to come out 
late June and expect to be completed early July. Yep. Uh, our next one, um, and Daniel, you can help me out with this one definitely because, uh, yeah, interesting one. Um, this is Teams Attendance Reports. We've been able to see an attendance report at the end of a, a meeting, um, but this is something more. This is MC260565, and we will see a tab which brings together the attendance report. Um, so on screen, it's, it's pretty cool, actually. I prefer to see this than the spreadsheet that we had to download beforehand. Uh, did you use the spreadsheet at all and, and anything you had to do, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, you know, using this, the, you download it, it's a CSV and you can, you know, see who attended, when they left and when they joined. Um, so it's kind of nice, but this, and I'm showing, we're showing this on the screen here, being able to see the, um, the, you know, all, not just the attendance report, but also the start and end time of the meeting, which is kind of nice mm. all in one screen um, and the average attendance time. So you don't have to go through and do any sort of analysis, you know, which you would have to do with, you know, when you download that CSV. So getting mm. some of that and I would, I would guess that maybe this might uh, improve. Don't you think Daryl, there's, there's some improvements here that could be made about engagement. Um, you know, was the yeah. person chatting? Uh, did the person speak at all? You know, I think that mm -hmm. could be something in the future, but uh, how many reactions? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, uh, there's that last column though, where it talks about the role and, you know, it calls out that, look, an organizer, um, attended the meeting. Uh, it might seem funny to say, really, I mean, should an organizer attend the meeting anyway, but there are meetings, of course, that are organized by some people and then not attended. Uh, so it might be a, a senior executive meeting and the person who organized it doesn't have the permission or privilege to hear the content that's been discussed in that meeting. So, um, yeah, good to good to see a report like this. Um, this is going to be rolling out early June and yep. expected to be complete end of August. So these are... A uh, slightly longer period there. Oh, it is something that you, you noticed, Daniel. It's, yeah, it's off by default. Off by default. So you're going to have to turn it on via a policy in PowerShell. And I really don't, un you know, my, my thought on this was why? Why is this turned off by default when we get, you know, some things are turned on by default that I go, why? Why, why is this on? But this one, I, I, I just don't understand why it wouldn't be on. But, um, I, you know, this is one of those that I think you should go ahead and turn on. There may be some reasons why you wouldn't, and that's fine for your organization. But generally speaking, I just get the feeling that most of my clients would use this, um, would, would like to have this benefit. So, yep. Okay, well, uh, your message next, Daniel. Tell us about this um, yeah. scheduler service. New service, scheduler for... Microsoft 365. This is MC260745. Scheduler is the is an add-on service for Microsoft 365, and it really is this digital assistant. And I've tried this in the previous kind of the way they start rolled it out in the in the beta was working with Cortana to in via email to schedule meetings. And so you would say, um, you could reply, you would at mention the Cortana service and you would say, schedule a meeting in, in the message, type out, schedule a meeting with them, you know, and get maybe give parameters, a 30 minute meeting for Tuesday or, or something. And then Cortana would actually say, uh, would send you back an email saying, okay, I'm taking care of it, but also would send an email to whoever it was and would work with them to schedule a meeting. And so that's what, that's kind of the first iteration of what this is. Um, you'll be able to decide, uh, you know, any of the parameters around, you know, what, what, what kind of the default, what's going on here. But this is kind of an automated method 
right? That a lot of people maybe get have gotten used to with find time, which is more of a manual method of, you know, here's all the options, send it to the other people. And then they select the options that they like. It sends it back to you. And then you, you pick and go ahead and manually schedule the meeting. Well, this is doing it all for you. Uh, users and, and really that natural language is, I think, one of the keys that people will find helpful. You don't have to be very formal with your the way you speak uh, and the way you kind of, you know, there's no formatting that you have to do in your emails. Like the first line has to be the ske- the date and the second line has to be the people. It, no, that's not how this works. Um, so it is an add on. And, uh, you, you know, so you're going to have to purchase it for every user that you want to use this service. Uh, so just I, let me kind of give you a rundown of my experience, a little bit of it. It worked when it worked. It worked really well and was pretty slick. However, I found it very finicky and maybe they've made improvements. I have not used this iteration, but it was very finicky when trying to evaluate what was being said Sometimes the meetings got scheduled on the wrong time, wrong date that I didn't, you know, that I didn't want to be scheduled. And it uh, sometimes it didn't understand who I wanted to invite. Um, and then the second problem that I encountered was if you're using this with other people who have never used it before, then mm. it can be a little, whoa, what is this? Uh, I'm getting this email from someone else that wants to schedule this and it's talking to me like it's some computer. Um, and I, I need to respond. Well, so there's that little bit of shock, but I had clients replying to the email cause I was just trying out with them and they were trying that you were either being a little cute with it, with the reply, or they just weren't saying the right words. And Cortana didn't have any clue what was, you know, what they were trying to say. And they thought they had responded to the message to schedule the meeting but the meeting never got scheduled. So there was a lot, there was sometimes when, when things didn't happen. And so I was like, on several occasions, I replied and said, Hey, you know, do you want to do this meeting? And the answer was, I replied and said, yes, I want to do it at this time because Cortana sends like options. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so it, it was just finicky and I would hope that it's fixed by now, you know, that it's not that I, I haven't used this. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, I want to ask you, Daryl, about that and about what you think about that. And then the cost for the add-on is $10 per month per user. So, mm. you know, th- there's that too. So what are your thoughts on that about, you know, using, really removing that personal touch with scheduling meetings? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, uh, one thing you said earlier is that uh, you don't have to use any um, formal language. And so if you're at mentioning Cortana, the assistant, uh, within the body of a me- an email and you start to, you know, blah, blah, schedule a meeting with this and that, um, it, yeah, can it almost sort of be a sudden change in the tone of what you're typing? So I'd see how that would be interesting. Uh, I know that well, it was phrased by by a couple of people in the community that this is where they tend to lose a lot of time is negotiating meeting times and yes. trying to find out something in common with everyone in that email conversation. Um, and I've found a lot of success with fine time. So, and that's that's part of the M365 service. I can add that as a free app, but. Yeah, just starting to talk about the cost of ten dollars per user per month to have this AI uh, is quite steep when you compare it to Microsoft Viva Topics for five dollars per user per month, and that's something that people have a problem with trying to stomach as well because they haven't appreciated the value. Um, yeah, I, I just I know that there's also this human factor behind it too that they've called out that there are going to be times when Cortana just isn't going to understand. So they do have a a group of people behind the service that deal with the exceptions. And perhaps that's one of the reasons for the cost of the service. Yeah, maybe so. And I would think if this was to take off, they're going to need a lot of people, uh, you know, in the back end working on this. 
And I, I feel like, yes, when using find time, there is that an cost of time because you do have to go and say add it and then go through the options. You have to check your calendar to say, is that something, do I really have that available or not available? Um, you know, because even though find time tells you if you're available or not and lets you pick stuff, sometimes you've marked stuff on the calendar that you're willing to overwrite, right? And, and stuff like that. And, and then there's the time at the end because it's changed now before you were able to do a one click kind of meeting scheduling. And that's not the way it works anymore. You click a button, it takes you to a site that then you have to click another link and then it opens up your meeting creation. But I actually am okay with that because I have more control over that meeting invite before it just sent using the same subject and everything. So the subject of the, of the message of the meeting was like re, you know, let's talk or something. It's like, what? Mm -hmm. you know, that's terrible. So, but it does cost time. And so this will save mm -hmm. you time. And I will say I, this is the future of meeting scheduling. Really? I, I just don't, again, I just don't know if it's there yet. Uh, I, but again, this, I was also trying this a while back you know, previous iterations. So, you know, this may be a, a great service and it may work really well. I think mm. we've talked about it enough. Let's talk about something <laughs> different than meetings and let's talk about, I don't know, meeting recordings. <laughs> meeting recordings. Yeah. Why not? Uh, so sorry, totally is the different. next one? Uh, yes. Schedule Microsoft search. Schedule search. Oh, there it is. Yes, yes. of course. Uh, Microsoft Search, yeah. Well, actually, it's it's kind of in the same uh, topic as uh, the transcription. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is about finding meeting recordings based on what has been said using Microsoft Search. This is MC260749. Uh, again, remember the transcription that happens with uh, a recorded meeting? This is going to become part of the search index you could say to try and find what the what what meeting you want to find uh, so if you can remember oh someone said something during this meeting about this i'm going to try and find the recording um, based on what was said what i can recall from the meeting then uh, you can actually search through uh, and the transcription will help you find that so i think this is going to be really useful uh, to to try and track down meetings and recall what has been said and try and follow up from there. Uh, I think though the uh, the other thing about it is that it's um where are we? Yeah, only attendees of the team meeting will be able to have permission to view the recordings and and the search results. So just keep in mind that it is adhering to all the, the usual security. It's not like someone who didn't attend the meeting can go to Microsoft search and say, blah, 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 Daryl said this, and then um, be able to search and find what I said in a recording. They didn't have permission to see that recording. Right. Uh, I, I think this is, this is huge for meetings. Uh, the biggest issue that I have with meetings in person meetings and online meetings is but in meetings in general is what was said. And, and I can't remember what they said about this or that. Now, you know, I think there's people have gotten used to that. So this is definitely a change. This is not a, oh, we'll just let this happen and, and it'll be fine. This is mm. a change that people are going to be able to find what was said in a meeting. And that, I think that's okay, but we need to be responsible for what we say. But we just have to remember that. Um, but I, I like this a lot, being able to, you know, find more content and, and expand the, the search. The, the advice is if you don't want the Microsoft Search service to be able to search transcripts um, or e-discovery, it says too, then turn off Teams transcription. So I think that's a little sad, though, mm -hmm. from that perspective, that if, if I still want transcription, I just don't want the results to be within Microsoft Search. I don't have that option. I've yeah. got to turn turn off the transcription service so it doesn't appear in search. Yeah, it just it's just another artifact, you know, that's part of and mm. so it's gonna be in search. And 
I generally like it, but I do understand it. You know, if you're, it is, you got to turn off transcript. If you're having a conversation, you know, legally, uh, that you, you don't want recorded for some reason, you know, understand that, but, but you're going to need to be mindful mm. of it. Yep. Where, when that warning comes up saying this meeting has been recorded, uh, you will probably be taking more attention of that. If oh, your words can be searched as well as watched. Daniel, tell us about Chat Bubbles, probably the shortest message title I've seen in a long time. We, maybe we need to do some research on, you know, it, what is the shortest message title? Chat Bubbles. MC261530. And this is another improvement that I love because when you're in a meeting, you want to monitor chat, but you sometimes you also want to see who's in the meeting. Remind yourself of who's in the meeting, especially if they don't have their video on. You know, what who is there? So I I hate having to switch back from the uh, attendees to the chat because I want to see what's being said back and forth. Uh, who's got their hand raised? Well, now I've got to go over into attendees, so I'll lose chat. This is giving us a feature where chats sent during the meeting will surface on the screen, will show up on the screen uh, just and, and making it available so we can see it, what's going on. The timing for this rollout is mid-July, completed by late July. Um, so this is rolling out tenant wide. And I think there's a, I mean, this is pretty simple, but there's a good screenshot here and I'll, I'll kind of show it. Um, the, it, it not only shows up as a chat and it shows up in the middle at the top, but it also shows who said it, which is great. And, and has their, their picture on there of their, their I'm guessing it's their profile picture. Uh, and it shows who said it. So, I, I'm really, again, that switching back and forth between those panes and trying to, mm. I've really disliked that experience. And so this, this is greatly improving it. It comes default on, but if you want to hide the bubbles, you can hide the bubbles. Just click on the ellipsis and say, don't show chat bubbles. I think this is something, there are some things in teams that come out and you're like, I don't really need to tell my users this. They're going to find it, you know, and it's going to be, it's just going to be this easy thing. I think this is one thing that you want to educate your users on because they're going to start seeing this thing pop up and see the chats and they're going to go, what's going on here? And it may mm. take them a little bit to put two and two. You don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it when you're communicating, whether that's in your, your, um, monthly standups uh, for education or your newsletters or your how you post in Yammer, however it is you do change management or organization you don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this but you know just saying hey this is what's coming do you agree and how do i get it, rid of the bubbles that are right, that popping up over right. the top of if, if roger's I, face if i want to get rid of the bubbles how do i do that i mean it, it's simple yeah. it's right there in the menu so you know, it's not one of those things that's really hidden or you just have to click on it and it says don't show the bubbles. So uh, it's simple as that. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have SharePoint. Dun, dun, dun. SharePoint. Updates. In this corner. Right. <laughs> Updates for Microsoft Teams connected team sites. Um. MC two, six, one, five, three, four. This is the other one we were talking about before about the community talking a lot, um, about a, about this message. So Daryl, can you kind of give us a summary of what this, well, uh, can you jump into this and give a little bit of a summary of what this is about? And then we can talk about some of the reactions yep. and what's going on. Yep. 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 Uh, well, message sent to MC261534. Uh, it, it is a little confusing, but I'll try to, to do my best to explain it, even though many of us have had to read this a few times. Uh, when we create a Microsoft team, we get a team site in the background. Everyone knows that, at least everyone that cares. Most people, they're just, oh, yeah, I'll just stick my documents in a team. We get a team site. Uh, when we create a private channel in that team, it creates a separate team site. And that's needed because it uh, 
it has its own security and it makes sure that the rest of the team can't see the files that are being shared in that private channel. This message, I guess it introduces a few things. It's introducing a new way to describe this. So I'll try my best to, to describe it as we go through. A team site that is automatically created is known as a channel site. Oh wait, I jumped into that a bit too early. See, I'm already stuffing it up. Um, a SharePoint team site that is created with a new team is called a connected team site. Now, if you look at it from the reverse, if I was to try and find this team site within SharePoint, um, there are other different types of sites, but this one is a site that's connected to a team. So it is a team team site. Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, how about you try and describe the, the private channel one, Daniel? Yeah, so we have a what's called a Teams Connected Team Site, which was what Daryl just mentioned. When you create a team, that's what you get, right? A private channel that you create in a team gets a site, a SharePoint site for its content, and they're calling that a channel site. So that's a SharePoint site that is a Teams channel site. Mm. Well, Lots in of, full, yes, in full, it's called the Microsoft Teams Connected Channel Site, right? As opposed to Team Site, yes. So though, that's that's the way they're starting to describe things. But the other side to this is there is a change in how permissions ha are being managed for these sites um, from SharePoint. Yes, this is an update. Right now, those channel sites, which is, the, remember, the private channel site, uh, right now you can't change permissions on the site in general. It, it is controlled in Teams. So whoever you add to that private channel gets permission to the SharePoint site. Now they're going to apply that, it says, the below updates to the viewing and management experience of Teams connected team sites. Remember, that's the what they're calling the site that you get by default when for the general channel for this site, right? Uh, or for this team, sorry. And channel sites, channel sites mean private channel sites, will simplify that end user experience and the way they're doing that. And this is very confusing. It says previously and currently, yet we don't have it yet. So call that previously is right now and the way we've had it in the past and then currently call that in the future. But basically, uh, sensitivity labels, information barriers, permissions, all will be controlled in Teams, not in SharePoint for that team site, the connected team site. We, we can right now go into that connected team site and change permissions in SharePoint, and it lets you. It, it doesn't affect mm -hmm. the team, team's team at all, the membership but it doesn't let you change that in SharePoint directly. You, but you, that won't be the case in the future. Now, it, it's not mm. specific on, right now, in a um, channel site, which is that, again, private channels SharePoint site, you can go in and share files and folders that is separate, change permissions to those things, um, all, you know, all you want in SharePoint. Are they going to remove that? Uh, uh, that's not said at all in here. So will we still be able to do that in the the Teams connected team site after they make this change? Maybe, but they don't say that in here either. Mm. Um, mm. And I think some of the confusion in this message, Daryl, is about terminology and really changing the way we talk about this. The other, and then this, let me, let's make sure we get this though. The Next uh, part of this is um, there's a visual update in a SharePoint team site header of that this is connected to a team, right? Uh, we've kind of mm. talked about that a little bit before, but they're changing it. And yeah, so how, this changed, Daryl. Well, we we went back and we we found an old message because we we're looking for a callback, and we found an old message from April talking about how a folder that is connected to a team let's say the general channel, will have a, a, a banner header along the top to say 
this is connected to a team and go here to go to the channel. Uh, so that was April. And now we're seeing this as a, as a fresh approach. It's, it's trying to achieve the same thing, but it's all within the, the menu bar of the, of the, um, the SharePoint document library. There'll be a go to channel button. And then in the, the name of the site itself, you'll have a little icon to say this is a site that is connected to a team. So two visual indicators, um, a deviation from the original plan, but we think that it's all coming together for some other changes in future around managing channels and teams. The uh, So I think with a lot of confusion that happened with this was really about they're trying to do a whole lot in this message, right, Daryl? So that's where the confusion, I think we've covered what this is changing and mm. what, what it is happening here. But the confusion really was um, this trying to introduce this new naming. And maybe it's not new to Microsoft, but it, it's kind of new to the community of what are these things and what are you trying to call this, um, at least in my perspective. But then um, trying to explain permission, the way you do permissions for those team sites, the what they're calling now those connected team sites. Uh, then I say it, teams connected. Teams team connected sites. teams sites, yes. Yep, versus teams connected channel sites. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Daryl. And then the indications in the library that it's actually connected to a team. Um, it, there's, it gets in kind of some weird stuff here, you know, and trying to explain things that I feel like it, it really didn't need. So anyway, that that's this message. Go, We're gonna... go on through that, yep. that learn more information at the bottom. I think the best article out of those, both of those is the managed teams connected yep. sites. It actually steps through a, a better explanation. Still, it's it feels like it's alluding to some future stuff, but it, and it's not a lot very clear there. But it's better than the message if you yep. want to get a fuller explanation. Yep. The uh, <laughs> last message before we get to quick mentions. This is Microsoft List. Sync your list for improved performance and offline access. MC two six one five three. Hey, this is an interesting one, uh, people. So let's let's dive into this a little bit here. Uh, it's rolling out in early July and be completed by early August. And they're going to update this with documentation once it becomes available. So we don't even have documentation yet. But this is this is what they're going to do is they're going to send you an executable through OneDrive sync client that this new executable will then run and sync your Microsoft lists to a local database via a web server that this executable is going to run on your machine. It's a lot going on here. Wow. Um, it, so this is, uh, it's called um, Microsoft Nucleus, Nucleus dot exe it's easy for me to say um that's what's going to be running for us on our machines and we're going to be able to interact with those lists offline right which is great you know if you have a laptop and you're working on data entry or editing or doing any any type of work with lists that's going to be great a great fu functionality now it's going to be on by default so if you want to change this, you have to use a GPO, a group policy, uh, to set settings, you know, whether you want to disable it totally, uh, block the external lists. Uh, so this is maybe a list that's shared in another organization. You're going to be able to sync that to your machine uh, via this. And so, you know, my comment on this is um, really... I really don't like having yet another sync client for a product, but I, I like the ability to do offline editing 100%. I like that, you know, it's going to speed it up. Love it. Uh, it's just got to keep in mind, this is yet another sync client that's going on uh, in the background. Uh, and you're going to have to manage from a, uh, from an administration point of view, 
Um, and we, we have a little bit of a kind of an experience with a product that syncs outside of the OneDrive sync client, right, Daryl? And, and have some mm. mixed experiences with performance, right? Uh, that would be OneNote. And um, that actually, the history behind that, OneNote used to be a collection of files and folders. And that, that's what it was. It was synchronizing whole files to represent a section in a notebook. And uh, a way back when they started bringing in Windows 10 client, they changed the database. And it is a separate database, a bit like this database that is going to be used for synchronizing lists. I'm not saying they're the same, but just the same concept. And one dry, one note to me feels like it's gone backwards with its speed and uh, reliability of synchronization. So I do hope that lists will uh, not go in the same direction. 100% I agree with you about that. All right, let's get to quick mentions and quickly do it. So Microsoft lists at mention people in comments, MC261024. This is rolling out uh, early June, so now past or earlier than now and expect to complete the rollout by mid June, which is, oh, now ish. Uh, for targeted release, standard release is mid-June through the end of June. And really, this is streamlining the process for when you at mention people. We talked a little bit about at mentioning. Uh, this has been available for a while. But this is the giving a streamlined process of when I at mention somebody, not only am I going to, you know, call them out, say, hey, you know, take a look at this, but it's also going to give them check their permissions to make sure they actually have permissions and if they don't it's going to give me a share dialogue to say you need to share this with someone with that person that you're at mentioning and then the at mentioned person of course gets a email saying you have been at mentioned uh, and here is a nice handy dandy button to click to go to that comment which is which is nice to be able to you know get you directly there so, like I said, rolling out in June, and it'll be interesting to see how people use this and, and integrate it into processes. Uh, do you use lists this way? And I'd love to hear uh, from those that uh, use lists this way and at mentioning people and, and work that way rather than in something else like, like Teams. Hmm. Next up, Microsoft Teams built on SharePoint uh, is a up will have an updated web player for video. That's MC two six one three five two. Now in the title, it's distinguishing. You have Microsoft Stream Classic, and it has a player. Uh, Microsoft Stream Modern built on SharePoint will have a new web player, uh, and so think about when we record meetings. Now it's been stored and in uh, OneDrive um, that you play a, a video file and it's like a file viewer for, for a video. Sure, it has the basic play and control buttons, uh, but now it's going to be um, updated and refreshed a bit. It's a bit better for accessibility, so the um, controls and the text are, are a bit easier to see rather than on this washed out white. And uh, I think in the top right-hand corner too, you've got some some controls around being able to view the the transcript as well. So uh, these are good improvements uh, aligning with um, the shift of meeting recordings into the SharePoint and OneDrive experience. There you go. Daniel's just showing video settings on screen and transcripts. It's actually video settings are important. What we are missing today that, that we've kind of lost from shifting from stream is uh, some of the uh, quality controls around show me this video in a different quality control or speed it up for me or, you know, those sorts of controls. Mm -hmm. So good to see that. Um, and Daniel, a, yeah, there's some, we've got uh, a, was it web version something? Yeah, we got some progressive web apps to talk about. Uh, install web version of OneDrive as a progressive web app, MC261535. And then I'm just going to show the next one, which is, Install web version of Microsoft Lists as a progressive web app, MC261537. And this is really kind of the same concept here, talking about, and rollout is, I believe, the same early July 
mid-July for targeted and mid-July and early August for standard uh, for both of these. That's the rollout for both of these. And really this is your users will be able to in um, Edge and other browsers. So this will be Google Chrome, Firefox, and any other browser that supports progressive web apps. And it keeps saying, with the exception of Safari, sorry, Safari users, you'll be able to pin and launch an app from your computer's home screen uh, or taskbar and perform the same actions that you would in the browser um, in that progressive web app. And I think this is good because th both of those products, now that we're going to have list syncing, but also OneDrive, you know, OneDrive, we, we really work with on our machine, but it's just files. There's no settings. There's no slick way of move. It's just, just files, you know, working with those just like we do in the Explorer. So uh, bringing that functionality, being able to utilize those additional functionality we see in OneDrive uh, web uh, really quickly and easily, I think, is a, a good thing. So um, there's really not uh, anything from a management point of view. I think there's going to be education. It doesn't even, in, what do you need to prepare? You might want to notify your users. Okay, may, maybe if you don't notify them, they just won't do it, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, but um, it is something that I think you should notify uh, your users. And let's talk about a callback, shall we, Daryl? Yeah, tell us about the SharePoint Admin Center change. Yeah, this is a message we talked about um, a few weeks back. SharePoint Admin Center, new columns on active sites. And um, I do have a demonstration here. It's pretty simple. Uh, that was MC258227, by the way. But this is uh, simply... We got two new columns in our active sites in our SharePoint Admin Center. One is Teams and one is Created From. Created From lets you know how was this site created. So if it was created by from a group, then it will tell you that. If it was created by the admin from the admin center, it would tell you that as well. Um, there's here's one that was created via a, a PNP provisioning, um, and then does this site have is it connected to Teams? So it shows you an icon of the team that it is connected or that it is connected to a team so just a a visual way and of course you can filter and sort on these so being able to say show me all the sites that are connected to teams boom you're, mm. do, you're able so to what that. are they again those are those are teams connected team sites those are microsoft teams connected sharepoint team site no wait just <laughs> see okay. anyway um I think that that does it for this episode. Remember, though, you can go and listen to the audio version of episode 199. The short link will be go.messagecenter.show slash 199 audio. So if you go to that, you'll be able to uh, quickly and easily get to the audio version of this podcast. Thank you, everyone, very much. Thank you, Daryl. Appreciate it. Thank you, Daniel. And we will catch you next week for the big two zero zero. Bye bye for Ooh. now, everyone. <laughs>